Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and the funny part about it is that every cell in the body is the same way, right? Like no, because you know there are thousands of cell, like trillions of cells actually, but thousands, hundreds of cell types probably. Um, it needs to be coordinated. So therefore, you must coordinate it with signals. And most of those signals are hormonal signals. And in this case, it's the insulin. So in type 1 diabetes, of course, there's no insulin. That's the pathology of the disease. And that's where if you don't have insulin, this blood, the fat cell can't take in those calories. And therefore, people, you know, even with all those calories, they, they just lose weight. They, they, they become extremely skinny until they die, basically. So what happens in this situation, in, in the situation, the opposite situation, where you have too much insulin, what happens there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then this is what I like about this segue is that it allows us to present the paradigm that type two diabetes is the opposite problem of type one, that I think it's one of the great, um, tragedies of modern medicine that we have lumped these two total opposite diseases into one family because they share one single thing in common, <laughs> namely that they both can eventually manifest with high glucose levels. But how they get there is two exactly opposite scenarios. So it's it's unfortunate because then we believe they need to be treated the same way, which just compounds the problem. So on one hand, Chronically elevated insulin causes insulin resistance. I have I've published reports on this. Uh, many other basic scientists have published reports on this. Clinicians have observed this. It, the the where with type two diabetes, um, there's there's um, I think it's important to note that in type two in true type two diabetes, insulin never drops to zero. That does not happen. It has been really, really high. Sometimes it comes down a little, but it is still multiples higher than it ever was before they started on that disease progression. So the idea, this this kind of cleverly false language of insulin production becomes insufficient to control glucose. Well, that's a pretty subjective term. It's They're still loaded with insulin. And by putting the type 2 diabetic on even more insulin, they become more insulin resistant. So a point that I was getting around to and distracted myself is that every cell type we've used in the lab, um, muscle cells, liver cells, neurons, uh, brain cells, if they are exposed to even physiological but higher chronically elevated levels of insulin, they become insulin resistant. You can create... All whether it's cells, whether it's animals, I've done that and published those results. Whether it's humans, that's been published in all three commonly used biomedical models: cells, rodents, humans. If you increase the insulin and keep it there for a period of time, they become insulin resistant. And lest someone think, "Well, I'm not a, a dish of cells or a rodent. I'm a human and I eat when I want." Yeah, but you probably eat a lot of starches because 71% of all calories consumed globally are carbohydrates. And you're probably like the average individual nowadays who eats about six times a day. And in considering that it can take insulin up to three or four or five hours to come back down to normal, depending on how much you ate and what you ate and how insulin resistant you are, it's not a stretch to assume that most adults and, and children is, are probably spending every waking moment in a state of in elevated insulin because they wake up in the morning, insulin has finally had time to come down overnight, and then they spike it with starchy, sugary breakfast. And then right when the insulin's about to start coming down, they spike it again with a mid-morning snack, and that just continues until their evening snack. And now they're going to bed hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic, and they're not sleeping well. 